Welcome to Math 344. So this is lecture 11. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to be discussing vacuum. So some people have you know, told me that they're going to try to you know, look up and learn the rules of vacuum. And that is not needed at all for what we're doing today. You know, I'm basically just trying to use vacuum as a springboard for discussing something you know, really important in the mathematics of sports. And it's trying to figure out how do we evaluate the relative worth of, given, of different positions? That is the greatest difficulty. And a lot of times, if you have a different evaluative method, you will get different recommendations of what to do. This is where you know, uh, we've had some articles on chess programs, trying to figure out what is the value of a different position. There are some simple statistics you can do. You know, in chess, we assign a queen as 10 all the way down to a pawn as one. So you can just count how many points do you have on the board. But that completely ignores where the pieces are and what they can do. You know, it's the same thing in sports. And so we've got some really great analysis being done on the single, double, triple home run. I think we're close to wrapping this up and having a much better statistic than uh, slugging percentage on base plus slugging is we're going to have a new statistic that's going to have these weights for what is the value of a single double triple home run. And it's going to come from what we really care about scoring runs. That's what matters. Now you have to be careful, of course, because in certain times, uh, people don't really care so much about preventing runs as they care about getting out. So if you have a huge lead, I will maybe pitch in a way that is more likely to get you out as well as more likely to give you a home run. Because I just really care about just getting out. I have so much of a lead, I can afford to make trades like this. So in backgammon, which is a very nice game, uh, my family has some interesting modifications of the game. I want something where most of you don't know the rules so that you won't be focused in trying to apply knowledge that has absolutely no bearing on the problem. And so we have the situation where there is a doubling cube. And in an actual game, the simplest way to use the doubling cube is initially either person can double. And if the double is accepted, the game is now worth twice as much. If the double is declined, then you forfeit and the other person wins. Once you double, you lose the doubling cube and it is now controlled by the other person. So the simplest problem is, what if the doubling cube can only be used once? then you have a certain incentive to use it because there's no harm in, um, well, I, I guess the harm could be there might've been a better opportunity to use it. But at the end of the game, if you haven't used the doubling cube, it was you know, a wasted opportunity. Then we wanna go to the situation where you can double and your opponent can double later. And then how does that change what you do? And then eventually we want to get to the point of you can have as many doubles as you want. And what do you do? What's nice is we don't really care how backgammon is played. All we care about is we have a game and at certain moments in time, we can assess the position of the board and then make the call double or not double. So here I just searched online and I found a backgammon board where this is nice. When I look at this, I cannot immediately see what is the relative value of everything. I might have some thoughts as to who has an advantage and who has a disadvantage, but you know, it's not tremendously clear. Can you give me some really weak, stupid results about when you might want to double? I don't want the best answer. Give me some stupid rules. When you're a turn away from winning. Okay, so if you're one turn away from winning and you're going to win no matter what, might as well double, right? What if you have a, okay, so what, what else? It's either double or not double. When would it be a bad time to double? Uh, when the other person is one. Yeah, when the other person is one turn away from winning. <laughs> So can you give me a certain critical threshold where below this threshold, you'd be a moron to double? 
Can we think of any reasonable, yes. Yeah, if you have less than a 50% chance of winning, then it would be foolish to double. As the probability gets closer and closer to 100%, do you think it's worth doubling? Let's say you've got a 90, or yes. Um, maybe not, because then your opponent might not take you up on it. Well, but here's the thing. Let's say I have a 95% chance of doubling, and I double. What would you do? You would decline it. And so I had a 5% chance of losing. And now I've eliminated that 5% chance. So it makes sense if I am extremely close to winning, I should absolutely double and basically just scare you out. And so if you wait too long to double, you've actually let somebody stay in the game too long where they have a chance of coming back. So the whole point is, there should be some natural critical threshold where above 50% we double. And then up to a certain point as the opponent, we would accept the double because if we decline the double, we've conceded the game. Well, if you have a very high probability of winning, I might as well concede the game. It's foolish to make the game worth twice as much when I have almost no chance of winning. But if you had around 51%, you know, it might be worthwhile for me to double because now I control the doubling cube. Now again, in the simple model that we're going to do first, you can only double once. So only one double. So let's say you double when have probability P of winning. And so the analysis I'm about to do is very similar to the analysis that many of you sent in. So let's calculate expected values. So expected values. So here is the start and we double. There are two possibilities. What are the two possibilities? Accept or decline. Which is the easier case to analyze? The case where the opponent accepts or the case where the opponent declines? Oh, yeah. Declines. So the expected value is just going to be one. You know, we get one point for winning the game. And what's the, okay. And now let's assume that it's accepted. So now there can be no more doubling. So there's two possibilities. You win or you lose. What's the probability you win? P. And so the probability we lose is one minus P. And so now expected value is what? What would it be? Two P. And over here, we lose expected value is negative two times one minus P, right? So we wanna figure out when should we double and when should we accept the double? So if I break it up into these two sides, this side is one. And what's the other side? It's 2p plus negative 2 times 1 minus p. So that's 4p minus 2p. Am I doing the calculation right? Oh, sorry, 4p minus 2, right? 4p minus 2. So when I look at this, if I don't double at all, what's the expected value? So what would be the expected value if we don't double? Two P minus one. And so we would get that by looking at two different cases. We win with probability P 
we lose with probability one minus P. So we would get P minus one minus P or two P minus one. All right, so a lot of math is about looking at expressions and trying to find you know, good ways to look at them. I'm gonna write four P minus two as two times two P minus one. Which is bigger? Two times two P minus one or two P minus one? Depends on P. So as long as P is greater than a half, this is more. So if P is greater than one half, then four P minus two is greater than two P minus one. And again, P being greater than a half is a very natural threshold. Below a half, you're in a losing position and you're telling the opponent, let's make it worth twice as much. Sure, right? So clearly, you know, if you're going to double, you want to have at least a better chance of winning than losing. And so if we don't double, if we just let the game go on, we expect to get 2p minus 1. If we double and the double is accepted, we expect to get 4p minus 2 or twice what we had as before. If the double is declined, we get 1. So. I'm gonna just redo this on the next page. And so double accepted, double rejected, and then no double. And then here I'll write the expected value. So here when the double is expected, it's two times two P minus one. When it's rejected, it's just one. And when there's no double, it's 2p minus 1. So what can you tell me about when I should double? So only one double is allowed. When should I double? Well, I, I need a specific rule. <clears throat> Double if? If two times two P plus one is greater than Two P plus one? Two P minus one. Okay. Two times two P minus one is greater than two P minus one. So double if, okay. So two times two P minus one is greater than two P minus one. But there's a better way of interpreting this, i.e. When is that true? P greater, than P greater than a half. Because no matter what my opponent does, there's only one case when doubling is not gonna help me when P is greater than a half. What's the one case when doubling is not gonna help me when P is greater than a half? Yes. Yeah, yeah. If P equals one, doesn't matter. You know, in that case, the opponent will clearly decline. You know, you're guaranteed to win. Can you give me a sport where someone can be guaranteed to win? I know at least one person here plays the sport. You're guaranteed to win? Guaranteed to win at some point. So as you give me a position and there's basically, you are guaranteed to win. I guess football. Is football. Like one second. Right, with one second left, you're guaranteed to win. There's not enough time to score. Basketball, soccer, baseball, no. Baseball goes on and on and on if necessary. So there are certain sports where you can be guaranteed to win. Even if you have certain penalties and whatnot, you know, and then there's an extra untimed play, your lead is so great that the clock will run out. 
So we could be in a situation where P equals one half, where you know, we can just run out the clock. And so if I double in that position, it doesn't really matter, you'll clearly reject it. In any other case, if P is less than one half, I'm sorry, note, if P is less than one, then what's the relationship between two P minus one and one? So if P is less than one, what can you tell me about two P minus one versus one? One is greater. So two P minus one is less than one. So if P is less than one, any reasonable game state, this is actually better than where I am. So moving from, you know, let's continue playing and I have a small chance of losing, it's actually better to double. And even if the double is rejected, that's fine. I now have a guaranteed win versus an almost surely gonna win. If the double is accepted, well, then that's clearly gonna be larger than two P minus one because it's twice that. So we know that you know, as long as that probability of winning is at least 50%, it makes sense to double. And we're going to do strictly better as long as we don't have a guaranteed win. And if we have a guaranteed win, we do as well. So does everybody agree on the analysis of when to double? And it's nice that it's a very clean rule. If you have a greater than 50% chance, double. What if you had a 50% chance? Then, it's, then you're indifferent. Because then in that case, you know, the person would accept and your expected value would still be zero. You know, they would be a fool to decline the double. When do you accept the double? So let me copy this. Okay. So we know, so we double if P is greater than one half. When do we accept the double? <laughs> versus rejecting. So now that the double has happened, we're definitely out of the situation of the no double. That's no longer available now. We have a choice. We can either accept or reject. So what do we have to compare now? Right. And so we want to compare two times two P minus one versus one. So it depends which way you want to do it. So I can do it and look at how much is the person who doubles expecting to make, or I could look at it as how much do I expect to lose? So either way is fine. You just have to decide which way do you want to view it? So do you want to view it now as you are the person who's making the decision and look at your expected value? We can do that. So um, uh, advantage if accept or reject. So it would be negative two times two P minus one versus one, right? So that's gonna be two minus four P versus negative one or one, no, I'm sorry, three versus four P or three fourths versus P. Will it still be four P minus two? Um, well, it, it's just, Oh, is P the probability of the player P is the probability of player one winning. So P is probability that player one wins. Anyway, we just have to be careful which perspective are we taking. Are we taking it from the point of view who doubled 
and looking to see what they get. Or it makes sense now because we're trying to make the decision, should we accept? We should put ourselves in the shoes of the person who has to make the call. And we see that you know, if three-fourths is greater than P, this propagates upward and the expected value is worse. So we observe if three-fourths is greater than P, then negative two times two P minus one is greater than negative one. So do we make things better or worse for ourselves by, by accepting? <coughs> worse. Well, which would you rather do? Would you rather lose a dollar or rather lose 50 cents? So which is better for us to have an expected value of negative two times two P minus one or an expected value of negative one? Which would be better for you? Which would you rather have? If P is greater than one. Well, so, so P is gonna be between one half and three fourths. So if P is less than or equal to three fourths, I would, put a, I would put a greater than sign here and that propagates upward. So I would then get that this quantity is greater than negative one if P is less than three fourths. So which would you rather do? Lose a dollar or lose 50 cents? I'd rather lose 50 cents. So is it advantageous for you to accept or not to accept if P is less than three fourths? Accept. Why I hate you know, problems like this in terms of which perspective do you want to talk about? Because we're now in the situation where we're talking about negative values and this negative number in absolute value is smaller than this one, but it's actually better because I'd rather lose less. It's, you just have to be careful as you do these calculations. So you would accept if your know, one half is less than P is less than three fourths. If three fourths is less than P, then it is worse. So you decline if P is greater than three fourths. And you're indifferent if P equals three fourths. This makes sense that when we're trying to think about what do we get at the end of the day, as P gets closer and closer and closer to one, you're screwed as the second person. Yeah, it's not good to be you. And so the closer P gets to one, it should be clear that you do not want to accept. You don't want to make the game worth more when you have a very small chance of coming back. So there should be some critical thresholds. And so you, if we draw things on a beautiful number line, so this is you know, the probability player one wins. So here's zero, here's one, here's one half, and here's three fourths. And so anything above one half, player one doubles. And then anything up to three fourths, player two accepts, and then here, player two declines, right? And this makes sense because as you get very, very close to one, you shouldn't accept if you were player two. Similarly, as you get very, very close to one half, the game is so close to being a toss up that why the hell would you forfeit the game and give player one the victory when they just have a small, small advantage? So if you look at this, you know, do we agree that the interesting range is you know, one half is less than P is less than three fourths? So this is the interesting range. And so by doubling, player one, goes from expected earnings of P, well, see, no, it was not P, it was, I'm sorry, it was 2P minus one, right? It was P minus one minus P, which was 2P minus one to expected 
um, two times two p minus one, right? So we gain two p minus one. So for example, if p equals 60%, we go from 60 minus 40 is 20% chance of winning or 20 or 20 points, we'll call it 20 points. To what? It would now be twice that. So 60 times two is 120, 20 is 40, so it would be 40 points. That's a huge advantage. And so the key takeaway from this is that you can use the double strategically. You can knock someone out and just make it too expensive for them to play. Well, if you wait too long to double, you protect yourself from the upset. But the real thing is you want to use the double when someone has too much skin in the game. And just the cost for player two to decline the double is so high that they hate it. I'm in a losing position, but I'm going to double. What could you do that would make it more palatable for player two to decline the double? What, will, what doubling change would you make? So right now, if you decline the double, player one wins the game and gets the full point. What could you do that would make it easier for player two to decline? Okay, well, if you continue, so if you continue the game, so you that would give player two the option of saying, I decline to allow you to do the double at all. You can't double. You can only double if we both agree to it. Good. Players Good. Also, net that the game is now only worth half as much. It's only worth half a point if you win because you intimidated the other person out. And so, what you could then do is you could say, depending on how much you lose by forfeit, now all of a sudden you might be more willing to forfeit rather than keep playing. And you could ask, how would that change where you make the threshold? So, it's a nice problem if you want for fun, investigate. You know, if we no longer, so I'm running out of colors. Um, investigate if a forfeit or a decline is now worth say F, which is in zero one, not F equals one. So you could then see how does that do it? All right, do we all agree that we've understood the simple case of just one double is allowed? We have a nice threshold, the intuition makes sense. And now it's time, you know, some of you had said some nice comments about this. What do we do when there can be two doubles? So you can double and then someone, if they accept it, they can go back later. So now, allow at most two doubles, player one is leading and has probability P of winning. So now if you're player two, are you more likely to accept a double or not? Why? Because it's you come back. Right. So the power of the double is that if the double is declined, you protect yourself with certainty against the upset, against the comeback. And so you recalculate 
um, you know, if player two accepts the double uh, and they're playing, now they have the possibility of knocking player one out of the game and protecting themselves. Yes. Don't you need to know a little bit about like how how those can fluctuate throughout the game? Because like in a football game, you could do this. Yes. So so if you want to calculate where um, you should double as player two, yes, because you need to know how likely is it for me to come back. So we need a way to model things. And so I know some people have suggested a couple of things. I want to give you uh, the model I came up with, you know, walking from you know, my office. No, I think I was walking from home to the office. So this was you know, around mission uh, tennis court area. This is one of the nice things about being a mathematician is you can prepare your lectures as you're walking and getting some exercise. I need to model what is the probability that if player one has a 60% chance of winning, is it easy to figure out what's the chance the probability that player two wins? 40%. I want to figure out though, what are the probabilities that player two gets to various places? So for instance, maybe player two is you know, losing initially, they've got a 40% chance of winning. They get up to a 60% chance of winning and then player one comes back again and wins the game. But at one point in time, player two reached the point where they had a 60% chance of winning. If player two has a 60% chance of winning, what should they do? Double. What if player two made it to an 80% chance of winning? Really double. And then even if player one then comes back, you got to the point where player one would be intimidated and would just resign. So this goes back to your comment that it's not enough to know we, we, we need to know what is the probability we reach different probabilities of winning. I know that if you look at all possible paths, I have a 40% chance of winning as player two, but I want to know what percent of the time do I reach maybe 80% chance on my way to victory. We don't necessarily have a continuum of probabilities, but if there's enough configurations, it might be close enough. And so I came up with a really, simple model. I am not saying that this is the right model. I'm just saying this is something that I could do in my head while walking. It seemed somewhat reasonable. I'm willing to risk and put myself out here and just propose this. All right. Um, I think I want to do this. So let's say player one as a 60% chance of winning. Okay. Imagine we have 100 tokens. Okay. 60 are uh, H and 40. Uh, T. I needed two letters. Yeah. In probability uh, history, H and T have a long distinguished track record. So I can look at all strings of H's and T's. So look at all strings of 60 H's and 40 T's. How will I decide who wins? Any thoughts? So I give you a string. How can I tell if player one wins or if player two wins? I want player one to win 60% of the time. Yes. Uh, if you took like any, if you say this should work for any number, but say we're going to cut the string off at fifty and we're going to count the first fifty. Okay. So if there's more heads, they win. If there's more pins, they win. You're on the right track, but that doesn't use the sixty percent. It's not using all the data. Why are you cutting it off at fifty? Well, if you count them all, then how are you going to win? Well, player one is not going to win all the time. I want somehow 
a rule so that for 60% of the sequences, I'm going to give player one the win. And for 40% of the sequences, I'm going to give player two the win. I'd be exhausted. I mean, I, I like to walk. I like to get my exercise. You can see me pacing now. I was planning this as I was walking to campus. Uh, not today. I was doing this on the day before. I don't want to do things infinitely many times. I've got a hundred. I've got strings. How many strings do I have? So it depends on how you want to, you know, count things. You know, if I consider all the H's the same and all the tails the same, I have a lot of strings. So the question is. Maybe I have 60 heads, but maybe the heads are all distinct. Maybe it's H1, H2, H3, H4. So maybe I have H1 through H60 and T1 through T40. So now how many strings would I have? I have 100 factorial strings. In the interest of time, I'm not going to enumerate them all. Can you give me a rule such that for 60% of these strings, I will give player one the win, and for 40% of the strings, I'll give player two the win? It is a finite problem. I'm not doing things in plenty often now. I'm only looking at 100 factorial. You're not going to hear that expression often in your life. OK. Um, Greatest baseball series of all time, playoff series. I'm Red Sox. Yankees, Red Sox, which one? Down 3 0, 2004. Why did they stop playing after seven games? So you need to know a little bit about baseball. Why did they stop playing after seven? Why didn't they stop playing after three games? Best of seven. Best of seven. Uh, some people consider the greatest World Series of all time, the 1975 Red Sox versus Reds. And one of the sports writers said, whoever wins game seven will have a decided advantage. Beautiful, beautiful sports writing. Now, imagine you're playing a best of seven series and you win the first five. Well, I'm sorry, you win four of the first five games. He wins games one, two, four, and five. Do you have to play game six? No. Do you have to play game seven? No. It's the best of seven. It's whoever gets to four games first wins. But we could maybe take into account that some teams have had a harder time than others. And it's not fair to expect you to have to win you know, four games. So if you can win two games, we'll give you the World Series. And the other team, they have to win four. We'll... And so we would keep playing until either team one wins four games or team two wins two games. How could we apply that here? Uh, could you like make it so that like whenever uh, each either A or B is consecutively together in a way that's greater than uh, the other one, then whichever one is greater than one. So if it was like 30, 40, 30, T would win. Okay, but if you do say it's going to be really unlikely with this many that you're going to get long strings of 30s and 40s. But that, that would be like that would be like one of the scenarios in which like out of the uh, hundred factorial uh, that, that would be just one versus it was like fifty. Okay, that's, I think you're making it too complicated. Look at the first five, in which everyone gets to three first. So one is uh, well, you don't want whichever one gets to three first. Whichever has more. From the first 
So if we look at our strings, we have a hundred options. Right? Filling them in. So option one, option two, dot, 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 option 99, option 100. What could go into this box? What are the possibilities? We have an H or a T. What's the probability we have a head? 60%. What's the probability we get a T? 40%. If I look at all random strings of 60 heads and 40 tails, 60% of the time, the final thing here will be a head. 40% of the time, the final thing will be a tail. Yes? There's no one true for the first string. We're saying if I look at all the strings, what fraction of the strings will end with a head? What fraction of the strings will end with a tail? Right? So again, I'm not saying that this is a great model. I'm saying, this is what I came up with. This is what I'm proposing. You know, it's all trying to find a way to model. Because the, the question that was asked is, well, if I'm trying to decide, I need to know how likely is it not only that I'm going to win, but I'm going to get to various points where I can then kick ass and then double and put player one you know, in their place. So another way of looking at this is if the final letter is H, it means I got to 40 tails before I got to 60 heads. So let's write that down. So, and with a tail, then had 60 H before we got 40 tails. If end with H, we had 40 tails before we hit 60 heads. So which do you think, if we want player one to have a 60% chance of winning, what do you think we should be looking for? We could say, I want the last thing to be a head. And if the last thing is a head, player one wins. And that will happen 60% of the time. Another way of looking at it is whoever gets to 100 points first wins. We're going to start player one off with 60. And we're going to start player two off with 40. So player one just needs 40 additional tokens to win. So if there are 40 tails before we get 60 heads, we'll say player two got up to the level they need. If conversely, we get to 60 heads before we hit 40 tails, then that means player two got enough to win before player one did. Thoughts? Yeah. How is it different from just Looking at any, any arbitrary index of the string and saying if it's if it's heads by one. Right? Because yeah. now what I can do is I can look at let's look at where am I after say seventy three squares, and I can try to estimate what's the probability that player two is leading after seventy three. And so my question is, can I use this now to try to get some estimates? on you know, the probability. So if we assume that there's 100 tokens, and then of course you could ask, how much is the scale going to matter? If I did 60 and 40, or if I did six and four, or 600 and 400, how is that going to change things? Will it change things at all? You know, I'm still gonna have the same percent over here. It's still going to be, 60% or 40%. It doesn't matter if it's 60, 40. It doesn't matter if it's 600, 400. It doesn't matter if it's 6, 4. This is a way to say, hey, look, first one to 100, 1,000, 10, whatever we decide upon is going to win. The bigger my number, 
the more probabilities in between I can have. And then what I can do is I can ask the question, given that I start off with player two in the hole, they've got a 40% chance. What is the probability that player two reaches that 50% threshold or 60% threshold? I can start asking questions like this. You know, this is similar to you know, random walks. You know, um, how many people have done like a random walk on Wall Street or seen papers like this talking about the stock market? You flip a coin, hopefully it's biased towards a positive return. And if you get ahead, the stock market goes up a bit. If you get a tail, it goes down a bit. There are issues with this model, but it's a very simple model to try to model you know, something like the stock market. And you can ask you know, when you have random walks, you know, how often do you get certain values? How far, how often are you a certain distance from where you stop? Well, if the random walk is balanced, so a head and a tail give you the same movement and they're both equally likely, you can prove that you actually return home infinitely often. And the math is actually really beautiful in both one and two dimensional space. So in two dimensions, if you can walk either north, south, east, west, if all four directions are equally likely, you return home infinitely often. If you move into three-dimensional space and add up down, then with positive percent, you escape. And I still remember my you know, sophomore math professor you know, explaining that this is why we live in three-dimensional space because for drunks who are walking randomly and just you know, throwing coins and determining how they should walk, three dimensions is the first dimension where you will escape from home with positive probability and just start to explore the universe. In an inebriated state, so you may not see as much as you would appreciate it. So here is a possibility of trying to get a sense of what would be the relative uh, likelihood if I start off down 40% that I will get to say 60% or something like that. If anybody has any other models that they want to propose to try to figure out, you know, please let me know. Uh, this was something that I thought would be very simple. I think this might be worth exploring. This is also extremely easy to code. And what you can do is you can create a rule. And let's code this and say, look, we've got 60 heads, 40 tails. We keep randomly choosing from our list. Every time we choose, we remove the element from the list. Or you just randomly sort the list and you start choosing the elements one at a time. And then we have a cutoff rule. And we say, if the probability ever gets to this percent, we double. And then what you could do is you could play this millions of times and see what is, ex what is the expected value for player two. We don't have to do this theoretically. You know, this is one of the points for the class. You know, I feel a little bit guilty every time I say this, especially since this is being recorded and I have a PhD in pure mathematics from Princeton. You know, you're supposed to want to prove things. And if you can, by all means, prove things. But if you can simulate it, that's fine too. And for something like this, we can easily set up a simulation where we just start putting down the draws and then we will have a fixed rule as player two. We will double as soon as the probability gets to this and see what happens. Yes. So just to clarify, so like, if the, anyone's had a player one wins, if anyone's fails player two wins? Correct. So basically throughout the game, if you're player one, you're hoping for tails every time. You're, you're hoping for player. tails every time, right. Is, and I, I could do instead of heads and tails, uh, basically uh, one way to view this is tail is player one and head is player two. And we're starting with 60 points for player one. So they only need 40 additional ones. And <laughs> it's reverse for the other one. So I'll send an email about this later today you know, to think about for Friday. But I think we can come up with some really nice you know, simulations to try to get a sense of what to do. And then, of course, we'll have a very simple rule. Play it two doubles as soon as the probability hits blah. And then it becomes interesting. You know, play one can't redouble afterwards. All right. So if anybody can think of a better model, please let me know. Right, this is a good place to stop.